When Troy Bannister founded Particle Health in 2019, he wanted to make interoperability a reality by developing a single electronic tool to collect a patient's medical records from doctors, offices, hospitals, and other providers around the country. Particle now exchanges more than 18 million records a month and is looking ahead to how to capitalize on its early success. Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare leaders about their lives and careers. My guest today is Troy Bannister, founder of Particle Health. If you like this episode, please press that like button and subscribe. Troy, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks for having me, David. It's a great pleasure. So we're going to talk about Particle, but before that, uh, let's talk about how you got there. Maybe starting with your uh, your background, just what your your upbringing was like, your childhood influences, anything that's that stuck with you from that from those days. Yeah, I guess um, early on, I gravitated towards entre- entrepreneurship. Um, I saw all my friends getting jobs bagging groceries, you know, working in the ice cream shop in the summers, this is, you know, during high school. Um, and I thought, why don't I just do something on my own terms? And so I started this small company called Ship Shape Boat Detail. I grew up on a small island outside of Seattle, a lot of boats and not a lot of people to clean them. And um, we kind of found a little market niche. Um, and when I say we, I mean, me and my best friend and a moped, uh, <laughs> we drove around the island, and we cleaned boats and I worked my own hours and I made cash and uh, it was awesome. It was a great, you know, uh, learning experience. And I think that kind of carried me into later in life where you kind of realize you can kind of, you can kind of make your own rules in this country um, around yeah. what you do, how you do it. So that's good. So now what, what kind of, what kind of cleaning do these boats need? Is it like a conventional cleaning or do you'd have to like know what you're doing with a boat? Well, we didn't know what we were doing in the beginning. That's for sure. Uh, you know, a lot of people would bring their boats out of storage over the winter and, uh, you know, come June would be plopping them in the water and they'd be full of cobwebs and sometimes, you know, grime and whatever. Um, so we would get in there with, you know, shop vacs and spring cleaning solutions and we would, we'd polish it up. Um, later we actually got into cleaning the underhauls of the boats, um, you know, towards the end of the summer, uh, we got a, a air compressor and a regulator and we went underwater and we were <laughs> scraping the bottom of the boats off. Um, so uh, we kind of expanded out a little bit as we, we figured out, um, what people needed. That's cool. Well, I guess it, it's good because it coincides, the boat season coincides when you've got summer vacation. So exactly. you eventually did go back to school though. And sounds like not working uh, always did. on the boats. I and, did. Yes. And what'd you do for schooling? Uh, I went to the university of Washington for undergrad and I got my um, uh, BS in physiology and, and biology. And then I did um, grad school out in DC and I got my master's in uh, biophysics out in, uh, at Georgetown. Cool. Now, it looks like you were riding the ambulances at some point. Yeah. So when I got to college, um, there was this class to sign up to become an EMT. And I was super curious about it. I was in business school at the time, um, but I ended up going. It was not at the University of Washington. Uh, UW didn't offer a course. It was at a community college, maybe, I don't know, three or four miles north of the main campus of UW. And uh, a couple of my friends and I would go up there three times a week and we took the class and we tested in got our certifications and became EMTs. And this is when I was like 18 years old. Looking back on that, I can't believe they let us be EMTs. We were driving ambulances around <laughs> Seattle, um, doing you know everything from you know puncture wounds to anaphylactic shock to delivering babies. It was a wild ride. Uh, I, I will say about 90% of it was very boring. 5% of it was interesting and, and the other 5% was insane. Yeah. Would you recommend that path to people, teenagers or young adults? I found it to be an incredibly uh, valuable experience. I think um, being that young and having that much responsibility and accountability is one thing. I think um, seeing people during the worst moments of their life and being the person that they're looking to for help was very formative for me. Um, It kind of made me realize I want to spend my time you know, in my life, doing things that help people. I saw the value in that. I learned that value early on in my life. Um, and it also made other things seem relatively easy compared to, you know, being in the back of an ambulance. Um, yeah. It, 
it was an amazing experience. And I often joke that if I ever, you know, retire, I'd go back and be a part-time ambulance driver uh, later in life. Sounds good. All right. So yeah. once you got out of the boat yards and the ambulances, then what, what'd you do after that, but before particle? Uh, so I, I ended up in DC, right? Finished my master's degree. Um, I was actually enrolled in medical school and, and ended up getting a master's instead of an MD. I just didn't want to become a doctor, which is a whole nother podcast. I'll tell you. Um, but yeah, we'll do another one. DC. Yeah, right. I was in DC. I, I didn't really know anybody there outside of school. Um, I have a lot of friends that were moving to New York and I thought, heck, why don't I just go to New York and see what, what's going on? So I packed up a van and I drove up to New York and I moved in with two of my really good friends. No job, uh, no money, <laughs> just a very expensive degree and a lot of debt. Um, and I got a job at Mount Sinai um, doing clinical research. Um, they were just kind of doing this thing called M Health back then, which is, uh, they stood for mobile health. They call it digital health now. It used to be M Health. Yeah. Um, they were doing things like text message based medication reminders, and they were proving that people weren't going to the ER as much. It was a very simple type of like early uh, digital health kind of, you know, research. And I was like, man, um, why are we not using cell phones in healthcare? You know, this is back in like 2012, 2013. Yeah. Um, so I joined a small venture fund out here called Startup Health. Um, it started as an accelerator program mm -hmm. and is now a, a VC fund as well. Um, and uh, I got to meet probably a thousand plus entrepreneurs over my three years there. And I got to see what yeah. was working, what was not working, you know, what it took to become an, an entrepreneur in healthcare or what a successful entrepreneur in healthcare looked like. Um, and I thought, heck, I, I think I can maybe do this. Um, and I also identified some core problems that all of them were having um, that I thought I could potentially solve. And that started, you know, my, my seedlings for Particle. Good. I saw a couple of other funds on there, Proto Ventures, P5 Health Ventures. How did those tie in? Yeah, those were kind of in between. Um, you know, I had done my startup health time, so I was familiar with the VC landscape, the startup landscape. And there were a couple of funds that were looking for support with portfolio companies or spinning out ideas from, you know, the, the fund into an actual business. So I did those, those are relatively short term engagements. Um, and they were really like, how do we go from yeah. zero to one, right? They're, how do we take this idea and turn it into something that we can potentially fund? And uh, uh, one of those companies is still going today, which is, is awesome. A company called Startup Rocket that does... Um, essentially builds infrastructure for, for entrepreneurs to start companies with helps you create a value prop, helps you create a business uh -huh. model, helps you create your first deck, helps you find the right funds to raise from. Um, it's a cool idea. Um, so yeah, those are relatively short engagements, but they kind of put me in that, like that vacuum of, wow, I have no safety net. I have no benefits. I have nothing. I just yeah. have this idea and I better make this idea work. Um, so I got kind of my, my, uh, my feet wet a little bit with those, those short-term engagements before taking the plunge into particle. Well, it sounds like you were pretty well prepared from uh, the boats to the ambulance to, you know, being jobless, but not, you know, not homeless, at least in, uh, yes. in New York, having a bunch of debt on you. And then I liked, I was, I was wondering where you're going to go with startup rocket. I, I understand now it's a rocket for startups. I thought you were going to say as it matured, they called it like a middle market rocket or something like that. But yeah, uh, it yeah we're sound at enterprise like rocket now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. Good. All right. So particle health. So what, you know, you'd obviously had a chance, as you said, you met a thousand entrepreneurs or more, seen a lot of different pieces. You were looking in the health space and been, even been in medical school. So when you were thinking about particle health, I mean, what was the unmet need? Was there something that you said, like, this is a, a hole in the market. I, I got to go rush and fill it. It was pretty obvious. Um, you know, I talked to, as I mentioned, at least a thousand, probably more, I'm probably under representing um entrepreneurs all yeah. of them were building some sort of digital health company and i think the thing in common that they all had was i have all these patients and i'm providing a service to these patients but i have no idea what their medical histories are and i really have three options today and this is you know back you know six years ago seven years ago um option one is i ask them the, what what medical histories they have i have them fill out questionnaires and forms which as we know, does not work that well. Um, it's also very yeah. annoying for the patient. Um, option two was um, I fax for those records. Um, the, the patient tells me where their medical records are and I have a team of people chart chasing, sending out faxes and requesting records. Or option three is I do the integrations into these hospitals myself. 
which takes, as you know, six months, 12 months, 100K, three people, paperwork, BAAs, problems left and right. Um, there was no silver bullet solution at the time. And when I looked around at other industries, I saw Platt and I saw Stripe and I saw Twilio. And I thought, why in the world does this not exist in healthcare? And before I answered that question, why I started Particle. <laughs> so I had to like learn yeah. as we went. Um, and there are, you know, a, there's a textbook of problems um, that were, were, that make it very difficult to do this. Um, and we've been chipping away those ever since. You know, I always one of those guys that, that love go to the doctor's office and they gave me this clipboard and it's got like some page that's been Xerox 10 times and I can barely read it and it's like all misaligned and I'm you know trying to fill it in and it's the same information on the first page as it is on the fourth page. Uh, so I, I, I miss that, you know, so you interoperability guys are really hurting me. So, no, all right, so you figured not. out there's plenty of problems along the way. <laughs> yeah, not easy to deal with. So, but how, how did you start off addressing it? Uh, good question. I, we, we took a couple stabs at different ways. So the question was in our heads, you have this group of data holders, these organizations that have the data in their systems. On the flip side, you have these data seekers. These are the organizations that need the data to do X, Y, and Z. Um, the, the law says they have to be able to exchange that information. HIPAA, High Tech Act, promoting interoperability. There's all these laws that say the seekers have the right to access the holder's data for the purpose of treatment, payment, operations, individual access. Um, what we learned very quickly is the law is not real <laughs> here in the United States. Um, just yeah. because it says it doesn't mean it's actually enforced or people can't kind of loophole their way out of it. So the question was, which data holders do we go to? Um, when we thought about it, there was kind of different levels of holders. You can go all the way down to the bottom to the actual practice or clinic or hospital itself and try to have a relationship with that organization and say, let us have access to your data. You can go up another layer and go to the EMRs that actually service those organizations and have the infrastructure in place that is actually holding that data and say, let's have a relationship. We want to share our data. You go up one more layer to the state health information exchanges that are you know really federally funded to a degree um, and say hey let us have a relationship with you to exchange data and then the last one is you can go up to this at the time it was a very new thing this federal data exchange level so we thought there was this yeah. hierarchy we started at the bottom and we worked our way up hospitals practices clinics not even close emrs nope no way state hies kind of sort of but very very difficult national level health information exchanges were so new at the time and they were federally regulated. So they were kind of following these federal rules to a degree. So we decided to go all in on the federal national network level. And so we found some success there. A lot of problems and, and uh, nuances and challenges, but it was our, our, our kind of first glimmer of hope. Um, and with one small integration into one of these national networks, there's, there's multiple national networks, um, we were able to pull some data out. And so we got one customer um, at the time, we were doing these queries manually. We're typing in people's name, date of birth, yeah. address, phone number, searching, doing zip code-based searching. We were staying up late in the night, eating pizza, dropping the data into a secure file transfer, and then sending them off to our first customer. And we're getting, I think, paid like 50 cents per record we were sending. And we were like, oh, yeah, we did it. <laughs> we're we're going to retire. Yeah. Um, yeah. There were a lot more problems in the way. Um, but that was kind of the first um, kind of, I don't know, six months to nine months of, of work was figuring that out. That's pretty interesting. You know, if I look at where you are now, it's not that much uh, later. And I'm reading a statement, something like uh, one contract, one API, every medical record in the U.S. Now, that is the polar opposite. Think of what you were talking about before. You were saying, you know, one con one contract, maybe because you just had one customer and one patient. But you know, if you actually go and and sort of boil it down to that kind of a phrase, um, you know, as my kids would say, are are we there yet? So today we have access to about three hundred and twenty million people's medical records um, using just name, date of birth, address, and phone number through our API. Our search uh, has a success rate around ninety percent. Um, so out of a all of our queries, 90% return records. Um, on average, we're finding 155 records per patient per search. And we are able to standardize that data into Fire R4. And we're also bi-directional. We can get data back into the EMRs. So this all works very well uh, for one stakeholder type in the US, and that is providers. 
Only providers today yeah. have the ability to, to use this. Payers don't have the ability to do it. Um, you know, life sciences, pharma don't have the ability to do it. And I think most acutely, consumers do not have the right to access their own records today through this method. Got it. So let's talk, we'll talk in a minute about those other, um, you know, use cases and, and folks that might be able to have access in the future. But what changed from the, the point of the pizza eating days to now uh, from your technical, policy, regulatory, um, cultural acceptance standpoint that's enabled you to get to this point? I think it's two things. Um, one is this concept of the national network has taken off rapidly. Um, <clears throat> this is a voluntary, you know, nonprofit, you know, or, or set of organizations. This is not uh, a federally mandated or penalized requirement for, for certified health IT. It's voluntary. And so it was a big experiment, um, really kind of spawning from a few EMRs that started it and has now expanded out to basically every EMR in the country. And so there's been a, a wild adoption of the national network infrastructure that we didn't think was going to happen this fast, but it has. So that's number one is everybody's participating. Um, number two is just the technology. Um, it takes a long time to build this, as you can imagine, right? We have to do all these integrations to EMRs. We have to account for all the variability of the standards and the data. We're dealing with CCDAs, which are you know nested XML documents that we have to convert to JSON structured fire resources. So it takes years to do the integrations, standardize the data, and then build a developer friendly platform. Um, single API, single contract, single data standard, every patient's record, right? That takes a while to aggregate and normalize and, and polish. Um, so today it's, it's, it's done. We've done that. It's completed. We can, we have, we're very, we're industry leaders in, in our ability to go find, fetch, standardize, and deliver data to our customers very quickly. Um, so it's, I think it's a mix of, it's a mix of adoption, buy-in and technology. So it's impressive. I think that you've gotten to this point. It's also, you were, you know, thrown around a few acronyms like high tech, which was back, um, you know, before the affordable care act, which really laid the groundwork. And we really did go from a very low adoption of electronic medical records to near universal. So at least of those records exist. And then there's the matter of knitting them together, which is a, you know, a technical challenge, but also regulatory and policy cultural challenge as well. And that's, that's done. And you're saying it works well for providers. So the reason it doesn't work well for other potential users is, is not really a technological issue at this point, right? It's more kind of policy and, and rules about that. And, and some of those things are going to change. Yeah, so this is where this is where I get all vim and vigor. Um, HIPAA promoting interoperability, High Tech Act, and most recently the Cures Act, which inv included the anti-information blocking provision, um, and then even more recently TEFCA, um, have all been how do I put this? Developed using billions and billions of dollars of taxpayer money to create better data sharing paradigms across the United States in, in the healthcare ecosystem. Um, the question I always ask every new employee that joins Particle is what does the P in HIPAA stand for? And most people yeah. don't know. Most people say privacy. Well, there's two of them, right? Yeah, that's one of them, the, portability. It is portability. The design and the intent behind HIPAA was to make data easily exchangeable for treatment, payment, operations, and individual access. That was why HIPAA was created. 27 years later, consumers still cannot get access to their data. Um, why is that? <laughs> um, the, the answer, in my own opinion, this is not sponsored or sanctioned by anybody, but this is my opinion, is that the, the powers that be, the large corporate conglomerates that have, you know, one organization has about 80% of healthcare data in their systems, uh, doesn't want it to go out of their systems. And that makes sense, right? This is, this is a very, very valuable asset to own. Um, maybe one of the more valuable data assets in the world today is the United States healthcare data eco, you know, ecosystem. Um, it is oil, it is gold. So why would I ever roll over and just let this happen? <laughs> so like, I, I'm not blaming anybody, but like, this is where we're at right yeah. now, right? Um, and so all these rules and regulations have, have matured and they're, they're lightly enforced, if ever. Um, and so we're at this point right now where this new rule, uh, anti-information blocking, um, is just is has become the law, but is not yet enforceable. Um, Steve Posnack, who works at the ONC, he's been there for a long time. He's an awesome advocate for for patient access. He's 
working the working the good fight um posted something on twitter a little while back and it was i don't know if you know that meme it's like a, a horse um drawing and on the left side it's drawn really well and in, in very good detail with shading and then as it goes to the right it turns into kind of a stick figure and he posted this meme and on the left side was policy written and then on the right side was practical policy implemented and it's very true right we we've, we've released this 2000 page document that details excruciating detail around how and why data needs to be open to pay patients and consumers and it just doesn't happen um, and so we're at we're at an actual you know a very interesting point in time right now where the info blocking um, rule is the law the penalties are coming right around the corner probably august september is what i'm hearing um, and these national networks are now debating whether to make consumer access mandated required if it, they decide yes then Consumers will have access to data via APIs in any application they choose. If they decide no, we're going to be looking at years down the road that that happens. So it's it's it, this is a very interesting time right now for consumer access. You know, I'm I'm old enough that I'm just proud that I know what a meme is more or less. But the way I've heard the version <laughs> of that is sometimes they refer to it as a podium policy, right? Like mm. somebody who's the head of an agency says, "Here's what's going to happen." And then you go into a, a company and you say, how come you're not acting on this? And they say, well, and this was the case with the FDA. I remember Janet Woodcock used to say certain things. And I remember having a conversation with somebody in Big Pharma. They said, well, Janet Woodcock's not going to be reviewing our application. You know? So yes. it's actually, it, it takes some time just to get it down and people to even realize, yeah, I heard it, but I don't, that doesn't mean it's going to change what my boss is saying to do or what I have to do day to day. And that's the challenge. It, it's it's a true challenge. I, I was in San Francisco back in gosh, I can't remember when it was. I want to. I, I can't even place the year. It was when Joe Biden was acting vice president. Let's put it that way. Um, and he was okay. Um, talk, he was talking about how when his son Bo was being treated for brain cancer, uh, they went from one uh, oncologist to another, and they weren't able to get his medical records from A to B. <laughs> this is the acting vice president yeah. of the United States. Um, and that was a mind boggling moment for me sitting in the crowd thinking, this is a problem, man. This is an insane, insane problem. So what is your sense of what's going to happen? You know, and there's supposed to be use cases, not just for providers, but, you know, for payers, as you're saying, care coordinators, yeah. um, are, are these things going to happen? Uh, how soon? And what would you expect is going to happen in terms of level of adoption? It's just going to be one or two you kind of like little anomalous examples or it's going to be a, a way of life. So I, I can speak to it on the national infrastructure, you know, level. This is, it's an interesting setup, right? So the, the, the way that it kind of is hierarchically set up is the white house manages HHS, HHS manages the ONC, the ONC funds a group called the Sequoia project and the Sequoia project runs this program called care quality. So there's many levels from White House down to care quality. Care yeah. quality is the, is the framework, which is the framework of the largest national data exchange for healthcare in the United States. I say framework because there's no technology. It's just a piece of paper that says, here's how you exchange data. Here's the policies. Here's the technical specifications. Here's you know, all the, the, the minutia. Um, so when you go to care quality and you certify into care quality, you sign the piece of paper and you say, I swear to God, I'll follow the rules. Uh, you pay the fees, you certify, and then you're allowed to go build your network. And a bad analogy is kind of like AT&T and, and Verizon. They got permission from the government yeah. to go lay fiber optic cables and build cell phone towers across the United States, right? T-Mobile built a network different than Verizon, different than AT&T. They all kind of had the same permission and the same specifications around what they can and can't do. Same thing kind of happens in healthcare. It's a bad analogy, like I said, but it's, it's okay. We got permission and some other organizations got permission to go build these networks across the United States. So here we are, we have this network. The network rules say you have to respond when a provider requests data. You don't have to respond when anybody else requests data. The federal rules say, yeah. oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, consumers and payers and everybody else also have legal rights to access this data too. You have to do it. So right now we're at this, this like I mentioned before, this influx point, this impasse where the federal rules are not matching the framework rules. And because this framework group is run and sponsored by the government, they're kind of getting pressured into making this happen. So we're in this very interesting point. So what do I think is going to happen? In my opinion, I think they have to make this happen. I think in the next month, we're going to see them decide that consumers and payers have the, the right to access this data. And then there's going to be 
let's say three to six months of, of arguing <laughs> over it and complaining, and then it will become a, a requirement. And we're going to start to see it happen probably towards the end of this year, early next year. That's what I think. Got it. You mentioned before about how you know U.S. healthcare data is among the most valuable data that there is in the world, and that that's valuable to many folks, including uh, the payers, the providers, life sciences companies, the consumers. But it's also potentially valuable to those who shouldn't have it. I'm talking about sure. cyber criminals, and so I'm wondering, you know, what you see as sort of the key data privacy and cybersecurity challenges, maybe that that are the same or, or different than what you see in just typical kind of data, other sort of data? And you know, how, do you, how do you address them as Particle and what does the industry do? Yeah, so I, I don't see the cybersecurity, um, let's say, surface area problem any different than financial data or anything else. Um, I think we see a lot of hospitals getting attacked in the United States with malware and, and you know, ransomware. This is because there's a lot of surface area to get in. There's computers all over the hospital. There's, you know, there's there's um, Ethernet or not Ethernet. There's infranets, right, where you can like log in remotely. There's a lot of surface area. Yeah. When you're talking about a tech company, it's way more buttoned up. In fact, at Particle, there's only one person with a break glass key to get access to PHI within our entire organization. Um, there's also a lot of standards, right? We have SOC 2 compliance. We have high trust compliance. Those are no joke. Those take years uh, of, of work to develop and certify into and a lot of money to do too. We have to hire consultants and we have to do testing and we have, we pay um, white hat, hat, hat hackers to be penetration testing particle constantly. So like we're, we're doing everything possible. Um, at the end of the day, um, the, the security requirements are to the nth degree. Um, for you to request your own record through particle, you'd have to do an IEL2 identity verification. And so we have partnership with Clear, like you see in the airport, where you have to take a picture of your driver's license, yeah. a picture of your face, answer knowledge-based questions, scan your, I think I said, scan your ID. Uh, you have to do a lot of stuff. You have to do a, li a liveness test. So we make sure that you're actually a real human yeah. being, a uh, live human being. Then you can query your own record. Uh, so there's, and then we have all the security in between, you know, we encrypt all the data and rest. We also delete the data. We don't just hold it around waiting to get hacked. Um, we delete it. Um, so there's there's a lot of security stuff um, built into the the infrastructure. Um, I, I I I don't. I, I'm not an expert in this, right? But um, I, I have a hard time seeing um, a a massive breach possibility, even just with the fact that we don't hold on to the data. Like there's nothing to grab at any given time. One of the things you see, I think, in uh, in Europe with GDPR is the principle of actually having the minimum amount of data and holding it for the minimum amount of time. And that exactly. in and of itself is that's, you know, data can't be stolen if it's not uh, if it's not present. And that's sort of a shift that's going on uh, here in this country, just starting to do it. Exactly. And it sounds like Particle's ahead on that. What do you do differently at Particle it's like, to differentiate yourself from competitors? Because like a lot of things... You had this realization around the same time that you know some others did as well. They may have gone off onto their own paths or a little bit, a little bit different. As you look around, you're not the only one that does something similar. What, what do you do differently? What do you do better? Yeah, it's it's very interesting to have watched the uh, evolution and I guess competitive focus of di the different organizations over time. It's a very big space, right? As you can imagine, um, how many? Yeah, it's you know, health, healthcare spent four point two trillion dollars, I think, last year. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, companies, That's big money. a lot of, it's big money. It's like somewhere around 20% of our GDP. Um, so there's, it's a big industry yeah. and there's a lot of room for, for, for organizations like particle to kind of carve out our own unique space. What we've always been focused on is, um, we've sacrificed investment, investing in UI UX historically, building a web mm -hmm. application, like an EMR kind of suite. Instead, we wanted to be API first. And we wanted to focus all of our investments on the data quality and the data insights and the data actionability. So that's where we spent all of our time and money is cleaning, standardizing, and adding analytics on top of the data, as opposed to building widgets or charts or graphs. Uh, we don't think doctors want to go log into a new dashboard. They just want the action they need to be presented to them at the right time in the right place. So that was our hypothesis early on, and it's worked pretty well. Um, the other big piece is um, one of our competitors is becoming a network. I mentioned there's a couple national networks. Okay. They want to be they want to be another national network. 
Um, we don't want to be a national network. We want to leverage all the national networks and be that value add layer on top of them. And so we're taking very different paths right now where they're going to become one of the networks. And we're probably, frankly, going to plug into them at some point now, which is wild to think about because we've been fighting over deals for like four years. Uh, we might now partner together yeah. and, and have our own you know, value props and our own missions and our own uh, directions that we're moving in. So um, very interesting to see how that's that's been matriculating. Um, I will say, though, that the startup cost and the time it takes to build what we built is not um, is not amenable to a lot of copycats. It's really freaking hard yeah. to build this, and it takes a long time. You can't just spin this up overnight. Um, it takes three, four years just to get you know an MVP, really, because you got to go connect to everybody's medical records and standardize them to even be at square one. Yeah, yeah. Now, would you say there's particular use cases that you're that you're focused on as a company? You talked about sort of some value of the functionality care. that you're building, but uh, yeah, yeah, value based care is is where we're seeing a ton of traction. So, you know, Oak Street Health was one of our earlier customers. Um, the problem with value based care, right, is I get handed a big batch of patients, and I'm now financially yeah. responsible for them, right? If they show up at the ER, that's out of my pocket. So, where does Particle come in? We have their entire medical history. We can see what conditions they have, what meds they're on, their last lab values. We can also see what happens to yeah. them between appointments, right? So if somebody's you know, health is declining, um, we can kind of nudge these providers to say, hey, this person might be trending towards an ER visit, um, time to take action. And so it's very valuable for a value-based care company to have that accurate uh, list of conditions, uh, list of procedures and lab tests and fill those gaps of care before that patient ends up at the ER, which also, by the way, results in great HEDA scores and star ratings, which just is additional revenue. Mm -hmm. Got it. I want to read you something you wrote in a recent LinkedIn post and just ask you to comment on it. So <laughs> you said that, oh uh, quote, particle... Uh-oh, that was recent. Don't worry, I'm not... This okay. isn't like from... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, found like some, from I found something yeah. from... Uh, I, found a, I found a note that you left on one of the boats. No, yeah, right. this, is, uh, this is recent, so... <laughs> He said, uh, particle must change and focus on a new mission, creating as much value as possible from the growing amount of data we have access to. So what do you mean by that? And then also, how does that relate to when we were talking about cybersecurity and, you know, deleting data, not having access to data? Yeah. So um, the mission we started out to accomplish was, can you put someone's name in the API and get all their medical records back in an actionable you know, setting? Um, we did that. As I mentioned, 90% hit rate, 155 records, national, one contract, one data standard. It's, it's working really well. So if you, if you sit back and scratch your head a little bit, um, the question is, what do you do next? And our answer to that question is you have, to, you have to think about what unique and valuable insight can you derive from that medical record that the provider on the other side needs to have that otherwise wouldn't have. In that world, that means we have to analyze the data within the medical record and, and create some sort of action from it. And this may be, here's a great specialist in the area, and we recommend um, that you, you send the patient to this specialist. It may be, this patient has a history of going to the ER, and we think that there is a high likelihood that they're going to go to the ER next week. Um, it could be this person's A1C values have been dropping, and they're headed towards uh, a, a diabetes condition diagnosis. Um, and so we have to be able to do that. When you mentioned, does this rely on, on, on housing a ton of data? Not necessarily, right? You don't have to have a ton of data in your system to be able to look at an analytics on one record. I think you have to have some sort of foundational yeah. data set to build those analytics on top of, but those exist all over the place. We don't have to house data to do that. So you founded the company, you've, you've run the company as the CEO, but you recently brought in a new CEO. And now I understand you're a chief strategy officer. So uh, what does that feel like? And, you know, is that a sustainable <laughs> role for you? Yeah. So um, I, I just was talking about, right, the mission I set out for has kind of been accomplished. And the next mission is a very different one. Um, a, you know, we're growing a business now, right? We're not just solving a big, hairy problem. Um, and two, that next set of problems is, is very analytics and insights driven and not national interoperability and data aggregation oriented. So it just kind of made logical sense to go get somebody that's an expert in those things and allow me to kind of own that, that prior mission. So um, as a chief strategy officer, I'm focusing on a few things. Um, I think first and foremost is going to be regulation and policy. 
what's around the corner? How do we prepare for it? What are we building? How do we document it? So we're all on the same page and we know what is okay and what is not okay. Just being like a, a subject matter expert in those things. Um, let's say consumer right of access happens tomorrow. Are we prepared? Do we know what it means? Do we know how to do it? Um, I'm the person that is kind of accountable for that. Um, number two, and this relates pretty directly to this, um, what do we build from a product standpoint? What are the requirements to meet the, the policies around individual access? Um, I'll give you an example. For, for this to work, you have to have IAL2 identity verification built in. IAL2 stands for Identity Assurance Level 2. It's a NIST score, the National um, uh, Institute of Standards and Technology Federal Program. Um, so what, is, what does IAL2 mean? What vendors are out there that do it? How do we implement and integrate that into our system? Do we offer it as an API? Do we offer it as an SDK? Do we offer it as a widget? I kind of have to think about that from a product standpoint. So that's number two. Um, number three is I've, I've been spending a lot of time kind of with these strategic partnerships. Um, and this is like new data sources we want to we want to bring into our, our customer base. Um, we just implemented ADT feeds, not just medical records, but we wanted admission, discharge, transfer notifications. So we went and partnered to get those plugged in. We're now looking at pharmacy data. We're looking at IoT. We're looking at genomics. We're looking at claims. We're looking at social determinants of health. We want to bring a lot of data in. Um, and then also enterprise partnerships um, on the kind of the sales side too. We're talking to some very large organizations and it's not a regular sale, right? They need education. They need some consultative selling. What's their data strategy? How does it fit in with the regulations around TEFCA? Do they want to connect to a QHIN or not connect to a QHIN? Um, these are answers we have for them, depending on what their needs are. And so um, being a part of that is huge too. So that's kind of what it is. Um, is it sustainable? Yeah. I mean, um, this is the stuff I'm good at. And this is the stuff I like doing, like purely. <laughs> like I kind of got to design this role to a degree. Um, so it's a very sustainable role. <laughs> um, being a CEO for five years as a startup, building a national interoperability company, I, I have, you can't tell because I'm blonde, but I have a lot of gray hairs in here, man. Yeah. I have a lot of gray hairs. <laughs> it's, it aged me quickly. That's um, good. Well, I, so, I plucked all mine out. So, you know, <laughs> I'm right behind you. Uh, so, okay. Um, the, it's a very, I, I took my first vacation two weeks ago. Um, that was amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm welcoming this with open arms. Sounds good. Well, Troy, my last question for you is whether you've read any good books lately, if you have anything that you would recommend. Uh, I just read um, Tomorrow, 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 a fiction novel about video game designers. Um, it was pretty good. I actually quite liked it. Um, it was, I, I don't know a lot about making video games. Um, and this was, a, it, was a, it was mostly... Um, I wouldn't call it a drama per se, but it was kind of a, a fiction drama about people more than about the games themselves. But they did a really good job um, with the storytelling aspect and, and integrating video games and why video games are, are you know, I guess important to culture or an important uh, storytelling vehicles. And I thought it was a good, it was a good take. That oh, sounds good. I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. Well, yeah. Troy Bannister, founder of Particle Health, thank you for being my guest today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you. Appreciate it. This was fun. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.